have that. Um, so now it's getting on to things, uh, the most important thing, um, introducing Judy, uh, who is providing the talk tonight. Uh, Judy was born in London, Ontario, for those of you who are not aware of that. Uh, but she grew up in various small towns before completing an English degree at the University of Western Ontario, and then her teaching degree at the University of Queens. Uh, she came to Gravenhurst High School back in 1973 to teach English, but then she left teaching in 1982 to raise her family, raise her babies. Um, when they were old enough to be in school full time, a fantastic opportunity um, as a li the librarian at the Ontario Fire College um, uh, popped up and uh, that started off a fantastic 20-year uh, career um, and the rest, as she says, is history. Uh, her third and present career, and it really is a career, um, is managing the Gravenhurst Par um, uh, Archives as a volunteer. Um, and that came with her retirement from the work world. The history of Gravenhurst is now a full-time, passionate commitment. And we are certainly pleased to have Judy with us tonight, um, as always, and very thankful for the great symbiotic relationship that the library has with the Gravenhurst Archives. Welcome, Judy. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome, Judy. Um, over to you. Thanks, Julia. And you're right, we do have a great symbiotic relationship. Another one I'd like to mention just before I begin is that I could not really have done this, this talk at all without some information and photographs, a lot of information from Jim Grove, Maureen Grove Chamberlain, Susan Kidd, Shirley Barlow, and Charlotte Neff, uh, who were all uh, very, very willing to uh, provide information about family members of their own. So with that in mind, let's begin to talk about people who came to our town starting in 1873 from Scandinavian countries. It's not moving. I'm gonna have to use that one again. There. Okay, I, I used that one before and it didn't work. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Seemed to be a stuck button. <laughs> Here we are looking at a first slide which talks about why did people come here uh, in the first place? Why on earth did they come from the four countries that I've designated as Scandinavian here? I think we would all agree that it's true. Norway, Denmark, Iceland, and Sweden. And they came for a lot of different reasons. And I think they're the typical reasons that people came from European countries, generally speaking. Uh, certainly a scarcity of land. As you know, these countries are nothing like the size of, of Canada. Uh, scarcity of land meant farms that were too small to really allow for uh, subsequent generations to farm. But when those subsequent generations or expanding families took a look at what were they going to do if they couldn't farm, they discovered that there was really a, a great lack of industry to move to. And so they were beginning to take a look at what on earth were they going to do with their lives. The economies of some of these countries were beginning to fail. There were some very intense political and religious um, questions, I think, being raised in some of these countries that made a few of the people who lived there feel as though they were very much, much on the outs. So along with a very, very active <laughs> group of immigration agents in North America, you know, the ones that we've talked about before who said, oh, come to Canada. Um, wheat practically grows by itself. Um, the animals become enormous. You can practically hardly, hardly herd them. Um, come here and you will be a successful farmer. I'd like to talk about another myth or two that have, <laughs> have reared their ugly heads along the way. One of them, maybe the first one, is that it was only a few Scandinavian immigrants who came to Gravenhurst. That, in fact, is not true. There were quite a number of Scandinavian immigrants who came to Gravenhurst. Many of them came to other areas as well in Muskoka and in the rest of Canada. I'm going to be talking about the ones who came here to Gravenhurst, but there were quite a number of them. And the second myth was that the name Swedetown was a misnomer because there were no Swedes in Swedetown. That's not true at all. The actual truth is there were lots of immigrants and there were a number of them from Sweden. 
In fact, when you look at this set of figures, you'll see that there were a number of families. And when we think of a family now, uh, I don't know about you, but I tend to think about the old nuclear family of mom, dad, and two kids. But in fact, we know that that's not true of the families that I'm showing you here. So when I say 12 families came to Gravenhurst from Norway, in fact, I'm talking about moms, dads, grandparents, sometimes parents-in-laws, and many children. Um, and that would be true of all of these. And where did that name Swede Town come, come from after all? Let's talk about that for a moment because in fact, the name Swede Town probably was a, rather an accident of anything. Um, I think that people living in Gravenhurst who uh, were by and large Anglo-Saxon had a tendency to hear the accents of people coming from Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Iceland as all sounding the same. Now that's not true, the languages are not the same, although they're all rooted in the Icelandic language uh, initially. But in fact, there is a bit of a lilt or a sound to them that might have made people think, oh, these are all, you know, th these people are all speaking the same language, they're all coming from the same place, and we'll call them Swedes, and the place where they settled we'll call Swedetown. In actual fact, here are, uh, here's a list of some of the families that came here from the four countries that we're talking about in Scandinavia and the dates in which they first came here. You will see, because I'm talking about 1873, you will see that in fact from Norway came a family called Fredriksen and from Denmark came a family called Fredriksen, both in 1873, similar spellings, not the same family. Two different families of Swansons, families of Hansen and Hansson, uh, uh, Johnsons and so on, Lawsons and Larsons were often confused. When you look at the names of these families, um, there's a reality that everybody has to sort of realize too. And that is that those are probably not the real names of the families at all. In actual fact, what happened to many families coming from any country, but certainly from these four Scandinavian countries, is that the immigration agents had a tendency to say, oh, well, nobody's going to want to deal with that name. Or worse, they didn't want to deal with the name. They didn't want to try the spelling. And so they anglicized many, many, many of the names and gave them names that were more familiar, um, might make life easier for them, certainly would make life easier for the immigration agent. So in fact, many of these names are not their original names. And if you followed their records back to the countries from which they came, you would discover that in fact, you had a hard time figuring out exactly uh, which family you were trying to find because the names would look nothing like the names we know today. I'm not really gonna talk about the Rosso area. A lot of Scandinavian families went there to Hecla, Kinmont, um, or even to the West. A lot of Scandinavians coming to Canada thought that those were places that they were going to. But when they got off the train in Gravenhurst initially, um, or got to Gravenhurst initially, they sometimes stayed here and didn't continue on to where they had thought they were originally going to head, like Hecla or Ross or whatever. So many went on, but many came and stayed. When they got here, where did they settle? Well, this is what we're talking about is Swedetown. And we're talking about the fact that they tended to settle in an area right around that little word Swede town down there. I've taken a map that was made for early days, early ways by Cecil Porter. And the map is actually representing 1860 to 1890 Gravenhurst. So we are looking at that time period that we're talking about here. And we can see that Swede town is on Phillip Street and that Phillips Street heads east from over on Muskoka Road. You can see where Muskoka Road is there. It heads east over to Gull Lake. Now, for those of you who are looking for Bethune Drive, it did not exist. <laughs> so there was no Bethune Drive. Um, and in actual fact, um, there was a second street, but it doesn't really show up here. You can see First Street. There was a second street that was in some places um, ex in existence, and it did in fact get replaced by Bethune Drive eventually. You will notice that on this particular map, Philip is spelled with two L's, which perhaps is not exactly accurate because in 1860 to 1890, Philip Street was spelled with one L. So uh, you'll see that interchangeable um, spelling of Philip going from slide to slide. 
Although many of the families did settle in Sweet Town, in fact, a few of them settled nearby on James Street, which is now Bishop, or on First Street around Royal Street. Um, and by the First World War, they had moved really all over the town as they were integrated totally into the community and married into families uh, that were already here in Gravenhurst or had come. This is a, a diagram or a picture of the Sharp land grant from 1872. It was the plan of subdivision that James Sharp imposed upon his, his land grant from the government. Um, and all I've done here is to take a piece of that land grant and to show you Phillips Street East from where we would perhaps think of um, <laughs> uh, Bethune Drive as being. So I'll say second drive or Bethune Drive is on the left-hand side and Phillip Street is proceeding down the middle. I've marked stars on all the places where um, people from Scandinavia built their homes. Now the names of streets don't exactly line up with the way they are now. Uh, Fifth Street doesn't really exist. Gull Street, which was along the edge of, of Gull Lake um, or the Gull Lake Road Alliance, it was actually called Gull Street, um, no longer exists either. You'll also notice that the street numbers that are on the um, diagram that you see here on this plan of subdivision bear no resemblance whatsoever to the house numbers that we now use in Gravenhurst. So for example, if you look in the first block, bottom left of the first block, you'll see 108 and 109 over there. 109 is actually my house on Phillips Street and its number now is 311 Phillips Street. So, um, or sorry, 331 Phillips Street. So you'll see that the 109 and the 331, you can't even see any relationship between the numbers there. Uh, but that's just to give you a heads up when you're starting to try to figure out where on earth we are. <clears throat> I want to talk about how these Scandinavian families built life in Gravenhurst and contributed to our life by building their families, their homes, and a church here in our community. I want to show you the homes uh, that were built by Scandinavian settlers, and I'm using present-day photographs. I have very, very few um, photographs from the 1890s of these homes. I have a few. They don't tend to turn out all that clearly. So I'm using present day home pictures, but they actually look very much like the homes did when they were being built. And I'm starting at the very east end, as close to Gull Lake as I can get in modern day um, on Phillips Street. And I'm going to show you, first of all, a house built by Neil Christensen with his wife, Minnie, and his children, Neil Jr., Bill, Roy, Ernie, and his little girl, Lily. They often were a home where newly arrived settlers from Scandinavia would come to stay until they could get their feet on the ground, figure out how they were going to make a living, how they were going to build a home. And you'll notice in this slide, as in all the ones that will follow, that in fact, I'm telling you the country from which Neil Christensen and his family came, and that's Denmark. He also was someone who would, when the Lutheran minister was coming to town, because eventually they shared a Lutheran minister with Torrance. Um, so when he was coming to town, he had to stay somewhere. Um, it wasn't always um, easy for him to head right back to Torrance. So in fact, he would often stay with the Neil Christensen family. Neil Christensen was actually a stonemason by trade. He was responsible for the stonework that was done um, on the memorial pillars. And I, I have a particular love for that because I have a particular love for uh, the, the great war soldiers that went from here. Uh, and it was, it was perfectly fitting that in fact, the women of Gravenhurst, who were the ones who actually got a memorial going in this town, um, were asking him to do the stonework because both of his sons, both Bill and Roy, had gone to the great war. So uh, it was very fitting that he was the one who did the contracting work. He also sometimes worked with Andy Ferguson on masonry contracts. He also built a small set of rental cottages on Gull Lake, just east of his house, because in fact, the street that we now see as Phillips Street didn't look then anything like it looks now. It pretty much stopped where um, Christensen lived and went into sort of a, round, a rounded, um, uh, end of the street, a sort of a, a, a cul-de-sac. And there was a large tree growing right in the center of that rounded spot. Around it, he then built his little cottages, which would have been right on uh, the shoreline of Gull Lake. 
So in fact, uh, he was one of our early settlers and certainly someone who did an awful lot of work on uh, stonework on the town. I'm just gonna go back a slide for a second and show you. If you look at the, um, what should we call it, the basement or the um, bottom layer of the house that he built, you can see that that's his original stonework on that house um, all the way there, all the way along the sides and back as well. If you have a rock wall, um, basement. Chances are if it was built sort of by uh, the turn of the century, by 1900, it was probably done by one of the Scandinavian um, men who came here as stonemasons. We'll proceed on to what is one of the quintessentially most beautiful homes in Gravenhurst, and that is what many people call the Broughton House. It belongs to Hillary Cole, um, but in fact, this house was built by Andy Ferguson. Andy Ferguson's name is even not even remotely like his real name. Um, I feel always so bad that I don't I don't actually put down on on paper what his real name was. But to be honest, I'm not sure I could actually manage it. Uh, so in fact, here I am um, talking to you about a house built by Andy Ferguson who came here very, very early on. He too was a stonemason, a contractor. He was a, a plasterer uh, and he built this house. He came from Denmark. A number of families lived here, including Peter and Charlie Johnston with their mother. Um, also the Hovda family, and we'll talk about them a little later. They lived here too before the Broughtons came to town. And the Broughtons, when they did come to town, didn't live there initially, but eventually the sisters and their mother moved to that house. Actually, I've got a lovely picture just in a few minutes of a confirmation class being um, held by Pastor Hovda. And he held those confirmation classes in the living room of this house. So if Hillary is in the living room at some point, she can be thinking about the confirmation classes that took part among um, the Scandinavian students. This house is across the street and some of you will know it by another name perhaps. Um, but this was a house that was also built by um, uh, Andy Ferguson, perhaps with some help. I don't know that from, the, uh, from Neil Christensen, but, probably, but definitely by, uh, by Andy Ferguson. It was a Charles Anderson home. Mary Olavson Hand Anderson, Alfred, son-in-law, daughter of Adolf and Julia Olavson, um, all lived here at one time or another. Uh, eventually this this house was no longer lived in by Scandinavian people and um, was taken over by a family of a well-known actress from our town um, who I will uh, mention shortly. And there's the Ferguson home that was built by Alexander um, or Andy C. Ferguson. Um, this home uh, does not look like it did when it was being built. It has some of the features, but there was a very serious fire in this home back in the 80s, I believe. And as a result, a lot of reconstruction had to be done uh, in order to uh, rebuild this house. But this is the Ferguson home, and I would think of it as being um, maybe one of the most quintessential families that came here uh, from Scandinavia. Um, their family spread out into all walks of life. Uh, the father, um, Andy Ferguson, was from Denmark. The mother came from Norway. And I'm going to show you her in a moment. As I say, Andrew Ferguson came from Denmark. Uh, his wife, Anna Marie Anderson, came from Norway. Um, Andy came to Canada in 1880 and arrived in Gravenhurst in 83. He too, a plasterer, stonemason, carpenter, and ultimately a major contractor. He was responsible for most of the early sidewalks, got the contract to do that in Gravenhurst. He was responsible for much of the exterior stonework and brickwork on the Carnegie Library. He was also responsible for the stonework on Massey Hall, Scott Hall, which we will look at in a minute. Some people who owned cottages on the lakes had him also as their fireplace builder, and his fireplaces were renowned. He was so well um, uh, liked and appreciated in the town that he was voted a town councillor, and he also was asked to be town assessor many times. That's his wife, Anna Anderson, on the left. I think she's so lovely, um, 17 years old when that picture was taken. 
And on the right, you will see Andy Ferguson and his wife, Anna, in 1938. And you'll notice that Andy is standing with his one arm um, carefully placed. Uh, it looks like it might be in a pocket, but maybe behind his back. In actual fact, every time you see a picture of Andy Ferguson, you will always see him with his arm behind his back. And that's because when he was building the wharf down at the uh, present day Muskoka Bay or Gravenhurst Bay, um, an explosion took his hand off and part of his arm. So uh, he always hid that fact. He didn't like to be shown as someone who, who was missing his hand. His daughter Gladys became a, a major figure in the town as much as anything because of who she married and who, who her children were. Those of you who are lucky enough to know Jim Crow um, will know that that's his mom and dad. And Gladys and, and Roscoe Grow were, were married in, in uh, uh, 1923. Uh, they were married from her home, which is the home right behind her here. And uh, then they walked down the street a couple of blocks and walked into my home, which was their first home on Phillip Street East. So she looks so lovely in that. And I think she's just um, the sweetest looking girl. She shows up in so many pictures. Um, and I, I love every one of them that I see. That's the home that she walked down to. That's my home. It's my home as it was in 1923 on the left and my home as it is today. And you'll notice there's not a whole heck of a lot of difference other than that we have glassed in, we didn't, but the people before us did glassed in the front porch. Otherwise, pretty much the same. The Angus Ferguson, another son of Andy Ferguson, another child of Andy Ferguson, uh, built this house on Phillips Street as well. You'll notice that many of them are Ontario vernacular style houses. And um, that was a very common farmhouse style to build. Uh, it was easy to get plans. Um, and I think that they weren't all that difficult to build. Um, Andy or Angus Ferguson didn't stay in this house for too long. He eventually ended up going up north to uh, engage in other lines of work. I'm showing you next the Hustlestrom house. For people who have lived in our town for quite a while, you will remember, I'm sure, Carl and his wife, Kay Hustlestrom, who were real estate agents here. Um, the Hustlestrom family came a little bit later than some of the families I'm talking about. Um, Gustav Hustlestrom came um, in 1904, and he came with Charlie Hansen. Um, and uh, two of uh, Charlie Hansen's boys, John and Art, um, came with them sort of to scope out the area, I think, and to take a look and see whether or not they were making the right decision. And very quickly, their families came to join them. Those of you who've lived in Gravenhurst for a while will remember all of uh, the people that are listed there. Uh, Ragna, uh, who just died not all that long ago. Thelma, Vern Verna, uh, Julia, and Olive, and I've mentioned Carl already. The four girls um, were uh, an integral part of Gravenhurst High School and then of the Gravenhurst community. Um, and Ragnar lived in the family home, came back to live in the family home after some years away in uh, British Columbia, came back to live there. And only recently did that home cease to be a Hustlestrom home. So I'm saying recently as in I think 2017 or 2018, Ragnar died. And um, uh, a sad passing it was for all of us uh, who knew her. The Hustlestrom family are shown here. Gus is on the immediate right, um, who was married to Bertha Olavson. Um, she, you'll see her house in a minute. She grew up across the street, um, daughter of Adolph and Julia. Um, Gus Hustlestrom actually had for a, quite a long time an ice delivery business and he had an ice house behind his home on, on Phillips Street. And interestingly enough, uh, cut ice for the townspeople. Uh, children apparently, and I have this on, on, uh, on authority from some of the children who grew up on the street. Um, the children used to be very excited to come along in the summertime and get chips of ice that had been broken off when the ice was being broken into uh, blocks. Um, they would have those to, to suck on. And uh, they loved to hang around when, when he was working on the ice. Um, I've mentioned on the um, on the right hand side of the slide that the girls and you'll see that two of them are in uniform in that picture. The girls actually joined um, uh, the Second World War. 
uh, as did Carl. Carl was a 48 Highlander. Uh, Rugner joined the RCAF and became someone who was very, very, um, had a very responsible job. She packed parachutes and taught other people how to do it properly. Um, boy, oh boy, you would want her on your side, definitely, because uh, she was somebody who was meticulous. And Thelma joined the Navy. Thelma's down in the bottom left hand of the three girls that are kneeling. Ragna is in the center of the, of the five people standing. I mentioned the Olafsons, um, that Bertha Olafson was in fact um, married to, um, to Gus Hasselstrom. Um, this is the Olafson house. It looks lovely um, today as it has been updated. It, it is now a and b as many people perhaps already know. But Adolf and his son-in-law, Charlie Anderson, um, um, did work around this town as well. Again, qualified and competent stonemasons and uh, builders and carpenters and so on. Julia, um, his wife, was a trained midwife. So when she came here, she was extremely popular because in fact, not only did she do midwifery for um, people um, in the Scandinavian community, but very quickly became known as a skilled midwife and was somebody that you could count on uh, to, to uh, help out a woman who was in, in, uh, at the point of delivery. Um, Adolf, uh, the man I've shown here standing on his front lawn, um, was in fact called the grandfather and uh, Julia, the grandmother of the community. They were seen to be the oldest people and the knowledgeable, wise elders in the community. Uh, so they were grandma and grandpa to everyone. The Olafson family uh, noticed the similarity in names. And if you took a look at that slide a moment ago, you saw that the Olafsons came from Norway. The Olafsons came from Iceland. The photograph on the right is a photograph of the house as it existed when Shirley Barlow grew up there as Shirley Tapp. Um, her father was the principal of the high school. Um, and that's the house as it was built by the Olafson family. It was torn down later and was replaced by a, a more modern looking split level house. Um, but there was quite a large Olafson family and um, they came um, with grandparents and so on as well. This house is a familiar house to me because um, I used to stop there and get invited in whenever uh, I was out canvassing for, um, well, for instance, uh, arthritis, or even when um, you were out taking the children around for, for Halloween. Uh, uh, they, they were so lovely and so warm and caring, and they were still living in their own home uh, when I was out doing that canvassing. This is the Charlie Hansen home. Corrine and uh, John, Arthur, William, Alfred, Erling, Charlie, and so on, were all children. And people who worked at the rubber set certainly knew um, a number of the uh, um, Hanson boys because they worked there too. Um, Mary Jane Russell Olavson had uh, three of her children with her. Her mother-in-law was living with her in this home as well. If I think that their homes were very important to them, more important than anything else perhaps was their Lutheran church. Uh, so in 1883, they built the Lutheran church. It wasn't on Philip Street. I wanted to include it here though. For people who have lived here for quite a while, they will know the old Scout Hall as it used to be known. Um, it was actually where a parking lot exists now, just down from Gravenhurst High School, just to the east of the high school on Sharp Street. It doesn't exist anymore. It is a parking lot now. It was torn down um, when it was no longer being used as a scout hall in 18, 1985. Um, but this building was, was built by the loving hands of the Lutheran community. Most of the men, when they came here, began working uh, in the lumber mills. They worked for Mickle and they worked for a number of other lumber mills. And when they left work after a 12 hour day, they walked up, and I mean up the big hill from down in West Gravenhurst, where they'd been working in the mills, up here. And they stopped right here at this spot and began working on a church. So they worked till all hours building their church. Their wives brought hot suppers to them so that they didn't have to take time out and interrupt their work um, to go and get food. 
When Charlie Hansen arrived, who was a very skilled carpenter, he crafted an altar, uh, he trimmed the windows, he built pews to replace the kitchen chairs that they'd been using, um, and a stone foundation and a chimney for a furnace were created by Andrew Ferguson, Neil Christensen, and, and uh, Gus Hasselstrom. Every Sunday morning, the services were, were conducted in Norwegian. That was considered to be, I think, um, the language that spoke to most of the people. In the afternoon, Sunday school was held in English, and in the evening, service again was held, but this time in English. This was a group of people, these people from Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Iceland, who believed strongly on learning the language of the country they had come to and who wanted to every opportunity to practice that language. This is one of those iconic photographs that I love. Um, it's a photograph of some of the women from the Lutheran Church, and I have named them all here so that you can see the, the names. Um, Mrs. Adolph Olavson is the name that's sort of hidden there, Mrs. Peter Larson, Mrs. Peter Jansen, Mrs. Peter Anderson. Have you noticed the repetition of Peter? There are in fact four Peters on this screen. Um, whether that was a true uh, rendition of their original um, given names or whether in fact uh, somebody in the immigration department had a particular fondness for Peter, I don't know. But anyway, there were lots of them. These ladies, of course, are not known by their own first names as women weren't at this time. This is taken around, oh, I don't know, about um, 1890 um, maybe. Uh, they were known as wives of their husbands. <laughs> but um, the photo had come from Gladys Bro, that lovely girl who lived in my home, the mother of Jim Bro, uh, grandmother of Maureen Bro. Another photograph that I love is this one of the Lutheran confirmation class. This is a class that was being held in Hillary's living room, uh, Hillary Cole's living room, when uh, Reverend Hovda lived in her home on Phillip Street. And you can see Pastor Hovda there, you can see um, a Christensen boy. John Nelson, who's in the back corner there on the left, actually came all the way uh, from um, Torrance to go to class. There's Tilly Jensen, Bertha Olavson, Angus Ferguson, and Edna Larson. So you're getting, again, more of the different names that were there. Um, lovely looking group. I will mention right now, too, that there is a project in place um, to create an interpretive panel for Philip Street. I'll say more about it later, but this particular photograph along with the Lutheran ladies will be part of that, that panel. Besides building their families, their homes and their church, these people who came from Scandinavia built many of our public buildings and certainly built much of our public spirit. I'd like to begin by showing you some of them at work. This is Andy Ferguson and his crew working on the Carnegie Library, which was being built between 1922 and 1923. Uh, we dithered on this as we've dithered on so many things. Um, and so, in fact, we applied for money in 1907 and then hemmed and hawed about the um, restrictions and, and uh, so on that were placed on getting that money. And then finally got our act together, um, this is town council, in about 1920 and asked for money, at which point they said, I'm sorry, this whole Carnegie Library thing is over. But we might be able to scrape together a little bit of money to build a library. We'll see what's left in the coffers um, after all the money has now already been divided and sent out. Oh, there's $7,000. Um, we'll give that to you in Gravenhurst, and you will build your library with that. It's um, another one of those firsts, if you like, or perhaps lasts. We have perhaps the smallest library built as a Carnegie Library, and we have the last Carnegie Library built as a Carnegie Library. Andrew Ferguson and his crew did all the brickwork and all of the stonework on that Carnegie Library. In 1923, um, after council had dithered since the end of the First World War and couldn't quite get together on how in fact they were going to honor uh, the soldiers from Gravenhurst who had been killed in that war, 
um, the Women's Institute went to council and said, uh, excuse us, but um, we would really like to get a memorial built. It's been four years, actually almost five, since um, our boys came home. And we'd like to get a memorial going. So if you would just give us the few bucks that you've actually collected so far, we will collect money and we will erect a memorial. I'm sure they did it very nicely. So town council were very happy to shift it over to the women. And of course, if you want something done, you ask a woman to do it. These women went out, collected money in the community, um, and they asked two things. They asked Bert Hawker, um, somebody who was a, a very well-known boat designer to design the pillars and Neil Christensen, as I mentioned earlier, to build the pillars. So there are the two memorial pillars. Um, you can see sort of vaguely on the front of one, the actual indented area where the uh, names were inscribed. There was a light on top of each. Those pillars were nine feet tall. They were made with local stone. It was pink granite. It was beautiful. Um, and they uh, nine feet tall with a light on top of each so that those boys' names were never in darkness. They got it done in, by the way, slightly under six months after they asked uh, to take over the project, uh, comparison with the five-year dither that had taken place earlier. There's another look at those pillars, and you can see the indentations just a little more clearly um, on those pillars from this vantage point. Something you can also see if I go back for a moment is the stonework around the base of the opera house. And if it looks anything like those pillars that are out in front, there's a reason for that. Those, um, that stonework was done again by Scandinavian stonemasons. In fact, Adolf Olafsson and his son-in-law, Charlie Anderson, did much of the stonework on the opera house. And you'll see in behind there, a little building that perhaps some of you are familiar with, and many of you who lived here a long time ago will know that building. Uh, that was the first and original municipal building built in Gravenhurst. It was where the clerk treasurer worked, um, and that little building um, was um, slated to be torn down in 1999 because it was in the way, and in actual fact uh, was saved by Phil Williams for a dollar, and he then spent probably about $15,000 to move it. Um, and it rests right now on a, a flatbed in the former Coon Brothers yard, um, awaiting its fate. Perhaps the most beautiful illustration of the kind of stonework that was done by Scandinavian settlers who came here. It's a stonework that was done on what was originally called Massey Hall. That picture was taken in 1915. Massey Hall was built between 1913 and 14 by the Massey family. Um, it was built on the property of the Free Hospital for the Consumptive Poor, or for consumptives, depending upon which name you wanted to give it. Um, and it was going to be the recreation hall. Um, Massey's gave the money for it. Ferguson did all of the stonework. And um, you can see that it has not changed one iota, really, um, in the photograph that was taken in about 1990 on the right. Um, and I can tell you, having been in there just in February of this year, it remains as it was, um, an incredibly beautiful building. It's also a building that we are going to have to be very, very careful um, to guard, safeguard, because uh, the Ontario Fire College closed, as you probably all know, at the end of February of this year. Uh, the property is up for sale. Um, we don't know how protected they, um, uh, these two buildings, or this building will be, um, but we certainly want to make um, good and sure that it is protected. It is probably one of the loveliest, if not the loveliest building in Gravenhurst. Not only did they do wonderful work on our, our community buildings, but they were an integral part of the community itself. And so uh, they were part of steamship crews, lacrosse teams, baseball teams, citizens band, schools, you name it, they were part of community life in every way. So I'm just going to really quickly show you the lacrosse team champions of 1903, looking um, quite cute in their, their little outfits. And Charles Olavson is shown there just to the left of center. Serious group. They had to, to hold quite a long serious pose, of course, uh, for a photographer to take their group picture. So it's not an easy thing to do to take a, a photograph in those days. 
the Gravenhurst ball team in 1929 post-war. There's Wilfred Hansen and Peter Hansen. As you'll note, those are two different spellings. They are not related at all, those two boys, um, but there they are in that ball team. There they are in the Citizens Band. There's Peter Hansen again and Bill Christensen. I mentioned that both Bill Christensen and his brother Roy went to the First World War as soldiers or signed up to go. Bill Christensen was part of the band which actually formed the nucleus of the band for the 122nd um, Battalion from, from Muskoka. And they served in the fire department. Now, interestingly enough, Adolf Olafsson, who's shown on the immediate left, um, was not in uniform in this picture, but he was at this point probably not fighting fires anymore, but had done so um, almost from the start of his, his living here. Um, and Charlie Hansen is shown uh, third from the right, um, probably the tallest except for the fellow on the extreme right um, of the group. You'll notice that many of them sport mustaches and, and so on, said to uh, help to keep the smoke <clears throat> out of their noses not a recommended uh, way of, of wearing gear. They became steamship mates and steamship captains as well. So in fact, you'll see here that Captain Alexander Peter Larson and his wife Annie are shown. Um, when he retired, the, the Toronto Telegram did a story about him as a sort of quintessential steamboat captain. He had been a deckhand on a steamship from the time he was 12, and he served on every ship in some capacity except the Sagamo. He commanded the rebuilt Nipissing, which became the sequin um, and on her maiden voyage and retired in 1950. I'll just go on pause because we're gonna get short on time here. Um, and then there was Nils Willison. Now for people who um, said no one ever came here from you know, um, Sweden. In fact, Nils Willison was born in Malmo. He immigrated with his family very, very young. And Nils Willison is pointed out in this photograph uh, by an arrow. Nils Willison um, was a wonderful man. His father was Olaf Willison, variously of Torrance and then Gravenhurst. And it was Olaf Willison who had built the Masonic building on the main street of Gravenhurst, for those of you who know it, um, doing all the work himself and taking two years to complete it. Nils was an extremely bright student and he came to Gravenhurst to attend high school. Um, he wanted to become a Lutheran minister. And so that was going to mean extra schooling. And in order to do that, he went and got his teaching uh, certificate so that he could teach school and make enough money so that he could go and do uh, the kind of graduate work that would be required for the kind of pastor he wanted to be. That man would be earning his money. I would think if you take a look at, I think 72 children there, and there's one other teacher, so split it in half and you've got 36 kids each it wouldn't have been an easy place to teach, but he taught in West Gravenhurst at the West Ward Public School for four years, and that's a picture of that school, and he is a young man. He moved into the home of Andrew Ferguson on Phillips Street um, when he was doing his high schooling uh, before normal school, and eventually be became very, very close to the Andy Ferguson family. Um, he married a local girl from Draper Township. Her name was Margaret White and eventually saved enough money so he could go to U of T uh, where he graduated in 1908. He became one of the first five students to enroll in the Waterloo Lutheran Seminary. Now, this is going way back for you people who are old enough to remember when Wilfrid Laurier University was called Waterloo Lutheran University. Um, he was the first student, first of, uh, first of five students to enroll in the Waterloo Lutheran Seminary, the, um, the predecessor to Wilfrid Laurier. He was the first to graduate as well in 1914. He took up a position as a professor at Waterloo College, then became a pastor, then became president and dean of the Lutheran College and Seminary in Saskatoon and then returned to life as a pastor before his death. Um, a student residence at Wilfrid Laurier University is called Nils Willison Hall. And uh, I think that that was a tribute to um, a very important man in the history of that, that Lutheran University. There he is there, there he is with his wife. To tell you just how much he loved the Andy Ferguson family, when Andrew Ferguson died, um, 
he came back from Saskatoon and wrote, he, he did love to write poetry. So he came back from Saskatoon, conducted the funeral, um, wrote a poem in honor of Annie Ferguson and, um, and stayed and, and talked to the family before heading back to his, his world there. And that's a photograph of him in his book of poems called Muskoka Echoes. Um, Charlotte Neff is the person who helped me so much with the Willis and uh, uh, family history. And that's his photograph as he was an older man. When the new country, Canada, said uh, we're going to war, there were Willisons and a whole lot of other Scandinavian young men and women who actually volunteered to go to war. And I'm just showing you a few of the names and people there. Um, one of only two nurses that I have been able to find who went from our community to the First World War was Ellen Christina Willison, sister of Anton Siegfried Willison, uh, both related to Nils. Anton is the only soldier from the Scandinavian community who uh, was killed in action uh, during the Great War. Uh, killed in action, died of disease. He contracted TB uh, during his service. He had been a bridge builder in the West before signing up for, uh, for going to war. But all those other names, as you see on that page, are all names of people who went to the Great War. Our Scandinavian settlers then did an awful lot of things for us. They became lumbermen, rubber set workers, stonemasons, contractors, midwives, florists, counselors, town assessor, professors, pastors, musicians, you name it. They were community builders, every one of them. In 1873, a man named Thomas McMurray had written a, a, a book about settlement in, in um, uh, Muskoka. And one of the things he had said was that people coming from Scandinavia would probably triumph here despite the hardships of settlement in this area because they were a strong, hardy class of men possessing courage, perseverance, constitutions capable of endurance, and insisted by just a little means were sure to get along well in this country and in a few years to become independent. And boy, was that ever the case. They did not rely on any, any help more than just the getting started um, in order to triumph as uh, settlers here. We are working on a Swede Town project. We've been working on it for quite a while. Uh, we're hoping to place an interpretive panel at an entrance to Gull Lake commemorating these settlers in Swede Town. Um, there will be the photograph of the Lutheran ladies, the photograph of the Lutheran um, uh, confirmation class, and there will be another photograph that shows some of the homes. Um, and we will provide um, information. It's in the printing stage right now. So in fact, uh, the wooden framework has been erected. Uh, the uh, panel has been sent to the printers to be printed. Stay tuned. We will announce when this is going to happen and when we will be unveiling the uh, Sweet Town um, project. I'm hoping that people will have some questions. I will be happy to answer them if you will go to the chat room. And, uh, and ask your questions there. Um, and my good friend over here, Megan, will, will translate for me if, if, as they come up. I can also just, so you're not looking at something bare and, and rather ugly, I'm just gonna continue on with a couple of more screens of photographs of some of these Scandinavian settlers. Any questions in there, Megan? Um, somebody asked, is there a reason that no immigrants I don't know that there is a reason why no immigrants are shown here to have come from Finland. In fact, some did, uh, but it was later. Um, Finland, as many people will realize, had more of a relationship with Russia and countries more to the east of them uh, than the countries like Sweden, um, Denmark, and so on. So I have a feeling that that was part of the reason why um, perhaps fewer people were coming to Finland in those early years. Perhaps they were, it was a slightly larger country too, and, and perhaps had a little more room and a much smaller population, I think, at that point. Mm -hmm. So you want to look at the answer that, perhaps saying that a less of a cultural, the rest of the Yeah, exactly. A very 
Yes, a, yes, a difficult language as well. And again, seeming more uh, to sort of aim towards the Slavic rather than the, the Scandinavian uh, part of the world. Yeah. Um, I just got uh, two, three, one. Philip Schutz, you know who lives there? Two, three, one. Um, that's obviously below First Street. Um, two, three, one. Is it the is it the house that's closest to the railroad tracks, and is it on the uh, which side of the street is it on? Do we know? Um, I can certainly tell you. If you want to call me, um, you can call me or you can contact me um, through Gravenhurst Archives, or you can call me at six eight seven six two eight nine at home, and I will be more than happy to look it up because I have got the names of some of the people who lived there and built there and so on. It probably will not be a Scandinavian family because right beside the tracks. Okay, because Sweet Town actually starts. Um, for all intents and purposes, a block to the east of my house, which is sort of where Third Street and the first entrance to the park is, um, from there over to Gull Lake is really sweet time. Um, somebody also said that they live in the Hasselstrom house. Hasselstrom house, yes. And they went all over to the, had a recent tour of their house. Oh, wonderful. Um, I'm glad one of, of the four Hustlestrom girls um, is still living and her name is Olive and um, or Ollie as, as most of us call her and um, yes and we're lucky to still have her. Uh, we're so lucky to have all of those girls in that family. Uh, wonderful family and a very very fun house. I spent an afternoon in there laughing so hard that I couldn't drink my tea or eat my cookies uh, because of the stories that were being exchanged by the various former denizens of Sweet Town. It was hilarious but not conducive to eating and drinking. I'll change slides again. There's another one. That's it for questions. All right, if there are no other questions, then I will thank everyone for having tuned into this talk. Um, I will put up one more photograph page here for you. Um, there's a high school class picture and a very tiny little Jim Grow down in front of my house. That's my house and my porch there. His mom is holding him upright. Um, he's just as cute there as he is now <clears throat> at age, what, 95. Um, a lovely, lovely, lovely man. Anyway, those girls are all from the um, Ferguson family, and uh, uh, you can see who the girls are in the, in the class picture. Thank you very much for joining me, and um, I'm hopeful that this talk will be posted on YouTube in uh, a few days, uh, maybe five, five, six days or so. Or yeah, hopefully this week or perhaps early next week. So you can go to YouTube or you can tell people to go to YouTube and you can in fact um, uh, go to the Gravenhurst Public Library YouTube area and you will find the various talks that I've done this year located there. The one I will be doing next will have to do with the Great War um, and a mystery surrounding um, our monument to the Great War. And I will be doing that the day before Remembrance Day. I will be doing that on November the 10th and at seven o'clock. And um, I look forward to talking about our wonderful Great War soldiers. Just one quick oh, a quick question, question. absolutely. Uh, uh, just says Alexander Peter Larson, first captain of Southern question mark? Yes. Um, yes, uh, when it was converted from the Nipissing and had been converted to the Seguin. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay, good night, everyone. Good night, and thank you very much, Judy, and thank you, Megan, for your help, too. Absolutely. Good night, everyone. Thank you again for participating.